Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening for another New Jersey Constitutional Republican virtual conversation. And it's a great honor and privilege tonight for me to have Dr. James Lindsay, who's the co-writer of this book called Cynical Theories, uh, written along with Helen Pluckrose. And if you haven't been watching YouTube, if you're not on Twitter, or if you're not following social media at all, then uh, something is wrong if you have not heard of Dr. James Lindsay. He has uh, really provided an academic look at what we're gonna talk about with critical social uh, justice and critical theory that we've talked about for years. So Dr. James Lindsay, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I am absolutely pleased to be here. So thanks for having me. Great. And of course, uh, just want to go a little bit, uh, talk about a little bit of your background and uh, your academic prowess is impressive. So just give us a little bit of introduction, a little bit of background on you, uh, Jim the Man. Sure. I, I majored in physics as an undergrad. I finished that degree and then I went on to get a master's and then PhD in mathematics. I finished my degree in mathematics in 2010 and then I left the academy. And uh, I started to study at the time psychology and philosophy of science, of religion. Um, in particular, the, the psychology of religion became very interesting to me. And I studied, you know, conversion experiences and, and why people get involved in religious beliefs and, and um, how they get sucked into cults was a very interesting topic for me. And so mm -hmm. I studied those things and then I kind of fell backwards into watching a early blossoming of the what we now would refer to as woke or social justice movement um, kind of around me and my colleagues, which were working within the new atheist movement, which many people will remember and maybe not so fondly. Um, but the woke explosion sort of took that over by 2011 or 12 even, and by 2015 had more or less gutted it and, and killed it. So we got an early glimpse at how wokeness can take over an organization or an institution or a um, movement. And so we started to study that, which led us uh, to doing a series of fake academic articles, which I think people are probably, they, they know me best for having done, which is the so-called grievance studies affair or the Sokol squared hoaxes as they were called named uh, in honor of Alan Sokol, who's a friend mm -hmm. of ours now. And so we, you know, we can talk about the details of that if you want at some point, but that led us to um, studying the critical theory developments in the postmodern school of thought as it has turned into the social justice scholarship. Um, probably, I would say that my colleagues and I, especially Helen and I, who wrote Cynical Theories with me, are the most educated on critical theory among people who don't believe critical theory. Right, no question. And uh, the grievance studies, um, they were put in academic and uh, journals that uh, many academics and uh, scholars look at. And uh, what you were trying to prove is the lack of um, academic rigor in uh, these journals. and. Uh, some of the uh, some of the papers that uh, were accepted were remarkable. One of them uh, was actually a dialogue or verbatim taken from Mein Kampf and applied to a um, applied. I believe it was a, a study on uh, uh, feminist studies, was it? But tell us a That's little right. bit about how how that all came about. So, um, like I said, we were recognizing pretty early on that something had gone wrong with these so-called systemic ways of approaching sexism and racism. And then that was creeping into social activism in various quarters. And so we started looking at the scholarship to try to understand what the difference was. And we realized that something was badly wrong in that scholarship. Around the same time, um, a very infamous paper, many people have now heard of, probably thanks to us, came out that discussed feminist glaciology and approach to glaciology, the science that requires feminism and feminist art projects and indigenous uh, mythology about glaciers to be incorporated into the science or it's a problem. And this was on, uh, on a research project, you know, it was one paper out of a broader research project that received over $800,000 of National Science Foundation money. And so we were kind of appalled 
seeing this. And then a writer in London who's still writing, Matt Ridley is his name, said that he held out that it was an elaborate hoax and was waiting for the, that to be, you know, to come public. And Peter Boghossian and I, who were working together a lot at the time, um, got on the phone and laughed about the article and said, why don't we write a hoax? I think it was Peter's idea. I don't want to take credit. And so we wrote an academic hoax and it was kind of an embarrassing affair that was called the conceptual penis as a social construct. It got some attention, but I don't think we achieved our aims uh, for the reason that the journal that ended up accepting that paper is probably predatory. And we then decided that we would, over the next month or so after that happened, we, we talked it over and decided, should we do this properly or not? And what would it look like? So we took all the criticism we got from the conceptual penis and then we went forward and built up what came to be the, the grievance studies affair. And you're right, what we wanted to do is we wanted to show that it's, uh, first, that it's very easy to do that style of academic work, that there's nothing really to it. There's no real substance there. And second, so, so that an amateur, we were all amateurs, none of us have a background in that stuff, could very quickly mm -hmm. become research level competent and secondly, we wanted to alert the public to this and, and what kinds of things are being published there. And third, we wanted to show everybody that the criticisms that we were leveling were coming from a place of understanding the material. We weren't just being reactionary sitting outside of it. We wanted to say that we understood the culture of critical theory. We understood the academic jargon, the academic structure of their arguments, and to expose it as, as sophistry at best and probably something much worse. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'd like to say, uh, and I'm going to call you Jim because I think you prefer that. And um, what I think is amazing is as a, a physics a major and as a doctor uh, in mathematics, you know, and I've heard you talk about how difficult and how challenging that is and how thorough you must be. And of course, there's a tremendous amount of objectivity with mathematics. And uh, of course, we'll talk about two plus two equals four and how that all came about. But what I want the audience to understand is, is that you have applied this um, rigor to the study of social critical theory. And you've put it in a book, but not only in the book, and we're gonna talk about new discourses, your uh, website, which is loaded every day with new information. This is just an introduction, uh, what we're doing tonight. Um, Jim, and uh, sharing, uh, sharing you with the New Jersey Constitutional Republican or our audience. And uh, I really, it's amazing, and people need to know how hard you've worked and continue to diligently work um, with all of the interviews and everything you're doing. And you've applied this discipline that you've uh, received in uh, the study of physics and uh, mathematics into this whole endeavor, have you not? Yeah, that's right. It's actually really interesting. <laughs> Because uh, if you go back within in critical theory to 1937, you have Max Horkheimer writing uh, traditional and critical theories where critical theory was first formally defined. They'd already been using it for about 20 years, but he really outlined what it was. And very importantly, he separated it from traditional theories. And his, his take was that effectively, the, you know, you could see the break as um, Marx's fav, uh, very famous proclamation that, you know, some people study the world to understand it, but you should study it to change it. Um, however, mm -hmm. he worded that precisely. Uh, so right. traditional theory is the attempt to understand the world as it is to have proper uh, models and understand the world uh, kind of accurately and rigorously, whereas critical theory is the attempt to apply both a moral lens, and in particular, that which is not Marxist is bad is the morals and uh, in social activism to knowledge in order to change the world. And so there's this divorce from critical and, and, and traditional theory. And I like to try to tell people that what I'm doing is trying to provide a traditional theory of critical theory. I'm trying to explain it and make it clear for people and comprehensible for people who don't wanna go read this intentionally impenetrable jargon and language, these very confusing terms, uh, these very uh, turgid books that are, are, are virtually impossible to read. They're, they're, some of them are actually impossible to read. Um, I mean yes. that quite honestly. I think, for example, um, I, Jack Derrida's yeah, of grammatology <laughs> doesn't translate into English. So if you don't speak French, mm. which, in which it's extremely difficult, and I don't, 
it's literally impossible to read because it doesn't have translations that, that actually work. Um, right. So I want to provide that, that bridge to people so they understand what this is, why it exists, what it's attempting to do, what it's, if I can decode its language for people and act kind of like a Rosetta Stone so they can see this is not a movement couched in the liberal tradition. This is an anti-liberal tradition uh, approach, then, I, then I've achieved something. That's really what I'm going for. Right. And no question. And, uh, you know, the, 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 you've really, through the demanding intellectual and academic rigor, rigor is really what drove you and uh, Dr. B or Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose to, to put up those previous studies. And that translated right in to cynical theories. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd, I'd like to read a couple of sections just from the introduction because people need uh, to go out and they need to purchase the book. They need to go on Amazon and get it. Um, you want to get this book, Cynical Theories. It's just, uh, I looked on the uh, New York Times bestseller list uh, yesterday, Jim, and it wasn't there, but uh, I would think it's going to get there and uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. But it made all the other <laughs> probably, ones. Well, there's a lot of woke out there, right? So it made all the other um, ones. I'll just point that out. Well, I surely hope it gets there because it deserves to be there. Um, I'd like to read a couple of captions from the introduction and bear with me. And then I'd like to get uh, your thoughts or just sort of um, hash out a little bit more what we can uh, get out of these uh, segments. Uh, this is uh, this was actually written originally in Arrow Magazine, 2017, I believe you and Helen put this together. And uh, it's quote, the progressive left has aligned itself not with mod modern modern entity, modernity rather, but with postmodernism, which rejects objective truth as a fantasy dreamed up by naive and or arrogantly bigoted enlightenment thinkers who underestimated the collateral consequences of modernity's progress. Really a great summation there. Yeah, that's uh, and um, another one. Yeah. And that really hits to the home, to, hits home uh, with the postmodern uh, idea of postmodern, uh, Jim, with the idea of, uh, of relativity rather than objectivity. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, the forwarding of um, kind of a cultural relativism and rooted in one's subjective experience rather than the belief that anybody can get to an objective standard to understand the world, whether that's science, whether that's following the rule of law. Um, for example, within law, we have a concept of, you know, the reasonable person. Uh, what would a reasonable person say in a situation like this? And we defer to that as a sort of objective standard within, you know, I guess the, the confines of a functioning liberal society. And postmodernism says there's no such thing as a, a reasonable person because everybody's biased by their, their politics. They say that there's no such thing as accessing objective truth because the attempt to do so is just an application of power in politics that allow people to mislead themselves into believing that they're speaking objectively when they're really forwarding their own interests without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. And here's another uh, segment from the introduction. Uh, it says, this book aims to tell the story of how postmodernism applied its cynical theories to deconstruct what we might agree to call the old religions, quote unquote, of human thought, which include conventional religious faiths like Christianity and secular ideologies like Marxism, as well as cohesive modern systems such as science, philosophical liberalism, and progress, and replace them with a new religion of its own called social justice. This book is a story about how despair found new confidence, which then grew into the sort of firm conviction associated with religious adher adherence. The faith that emerged is thoroughly postmodern, which means that rather than interpreting the world in terms of supple spiritual forces like sin and magic, it focuses instead on supple material forces such as systematic bigotry and diffuse but omnipresent systems of power and privilege. Wonderfully written and uh, flushed that out a little bit for us. Yeah, that's um, the kind of core th assumption underlying the, the postmodern worldview is that everything boils down to power. Everything comes back to power. 
Uh, so if you try to, to make a statement about something, the, the methods that you use to decide that that statement was true are power. Your mm -hmm. ability to make the statement to people and to be heard and be listened to, listened to is an exertion of power. Um, when we add in the critical theory element, which is what happened uh, uh, that we document in the book, that postmodernism and critical theory fused into a single thing in the 1990s, um, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you get the privilege dimension. So all of a sudden you have this idea that certain people are uh, this, this class of people who, who have the have access to the advantages of society and those people are privileged, uh, relatively speaking. And then there are people who do not have those accesses and who are excluded from those, ac the, 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 those opportunities and resources by the privileged uh, and those people are oppressed. So you have Marx's oppressor versus oppressed dichotomy and Marx's mm -hmm. zero sum conflict theory now applied across that bridge and this is how the ideology we're dealing with today with social justice sees the world. And it sees that these, these dynamics of power um, are, are impediments to producing social justice or fairness or specifically outcomes that are equal. Equal outcomes are, right. is the measuring stick that it uses. Um, and so the idea that deferring to an objective standard or that, that scientific reasoning or the, the arbiter, the external arbiter of, of evidence um, is actually something that, that, that takes away bias, that takes away bigotry, that, that minimizes their impact, is utterly foreign to this way of thinking. It can't conceive of that. And instead, it has to see that as saying, no, that's a white Western way of know, knowing created by men, in particular straight men, who wanted to maintain their power over other people. And then they say, look at all these cynical ways that we can point out how that has been true as the development of these ideas. It's not like science came into existence. Francis Bacon snapped his fingers and now we're all scientific. It's not like Thomas right. Paine wrote common sense and all of a sudden the world's liberal. These things evolved mm -hmm. over time. There were lessons to be learned. There were mistakes that were made. There were failures. There was a whole learning process. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to show how there were shortcomings and then say in a very cynical and negative way, oh, the whole thing has been rotten from the beginning without noticing mm. the clear track of progress uh, and, and that the deferring to these objective standards like let's set up an objective rule of law we're going to this is the law today we're going to follow the law today as though it's you know deontological if you want to get philosophical as if it's given down by god if you want to put it that way but we're also going to realize mm. that we're fallible humans so here's a process with divided powers so it can't get out of control where we can change the law if we need to. So let's let's mm -hmm. slow everything down. Let's take a step back. Let's take as much vested interest out of it as possible with the divided powers and so on. This actually works. This actually causes us to be able to fulfill right. the promises of the Constitution and, and the Declaration of Independence about equality and, be, uh, you know, the, the, the natural rights of, of people. Uh, being, they say, imbued by your creator and, and the role of government is to secure those rights. Um, this is how that's possible, but they're utterly cynical about that because they can point to these failure points along the way where we failed to live up to our, our ideals um, or we failed to, to execute these things perfectly or where human failure has, has stepped in and gotten the better of us. And they say, so the whole project must have been rotten. Right. Very good. And also another section uh, from the introduction, uh, Jim, I'd like to read is, quote, this is not a book that seeks to undermine liberal feminism, activism against racism, or campaigns for LBGT equality. On the contrary, Cynical Theories is born out of our commitment to gender, racial, and LBGT equality, and our concern that the validity and importance of these are currently being alarmingly undermined by social justice approaches nor will this book attack scholarship or the university general. Quite the contrary, we seek to defend rigorous, evidence-based scholarship and the essential function of the university as a center of knowledge production against anti-empirical, anti-irrational, and illiberal currents on the left that threaten to give power to anti-intellectual, anti-equality, and illiberal concerns on the right. So that really spells it out, uh, the, your, the neutrality that's there and uh, the moderation uh, that you have incorporated in this whole uh, endeavor. Yeah, our goal is to be honest. 
that is simple right. as it can be said is just to be honest about what's going on. There are excesses. Anytime you have sides, if you will, there are excesses that can arise on each side. We understand very clearly the dynamics of polarization. So in other words, that the excesses on one side can feed the excesses on the other. And what we're trying to call for is a fair assessment that doesn't take a partisan stance that says, let's get back to neutral, the most neutral standards that we can, and let's debate the issues. When evidence is available, that's something we all have to defer to because it's outside of people. When the law is, is, is in question, the same thing. When we have a difference of opinion and philosophy, then we can have a debate where you can forward an idea and I can forward an idea. Back in the day, they called this dialectic. You have a thesis, I have mm -hmm. its antithesis. We can either hunt for a synthesis, we can agree to disagree and see each other as um, friends who don't necessarily see things the same way. These rules of engagement that have defined and enabled liberal society to grow and flourish, again, imperfectly throughout history, I think, and I think Helen, I can speak for her, are the, the most uh, valuable things that I think humanity has invented, and they are constantly under threat. The, the, the saying was, mm -hmm. the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Um, so they're constantly under threat, and we're, we're a bit used to them being under threat uh, from far-right groups that want to kind of mm -hmm. bend back to a pre-modern view of the world, whether it's super religious, whether that's monarchical, whether that's mm -hmm. um, downright racist or something like this. We're, mm -hmm. I don't know why we're less familiar with seeing it from the left as it keeps popping up through history and killing hundreds of millions of people, but the left has its excesses too. And the left team tends right. not to be very good at seeing its own excesses, um, but it can also be illiberal. It can also threaten uh, our, our liberal order. It can also be hostile to our liberal order, usually in the name of something that's been named uh, radical egalitarianism or radical humanitarianism. Mm -hmm. And uh, one short caption, one last caption from the introduction I'd like to read is to get people to salivate on wanting to get this book and read it. And it says, this book then ultimately seeks to present a philosophical liberal critique of social justice scholarship and activism and argues that this scholarship activism does not further social justice and equality aims. And this is precisely what, uh, what what we're talking about here with the book, um, Jim. Now, your uh, personal position—you, I've heard you um, describe yourself as a liberal libertarian, mm -hmm. and uh, so you're not you're 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 not far right, you're not far left, uh, and you've you've always pro primarily have you been you've been progressive in your in your uh, political thoughts. Is is that true? Yes, that's that's true on uh, basically all the levels. Um, certainly quite libertarian. Uh, I would say that I'm rather almost radically socially liberal and progressive. And then, but in the sense that, you know, uh, reality still weighs in on things at the end of the day. Fiscally, I mean, I'm, I, I describe myself for, for those that would understand this as a minarchist who believes in a bigger min than you. Right. Uh, and so right. I've heard that's, you say that. Yeah, that's that's sort of the way that I, I, I think of the thing. I, I, I am, if, if you believe in these political compass tests, I fall pretty uh, pretty consistently near the middle of the left half of the spectrum and pretty close to um, three quarters or so of the way down in libertarian or freedom minded. I need to figure out which uh, founding father that puts me most close to that would be helpful to communicate this. I hope it's Madison, frankly, but I don't know. Well, that's a good uh, that's a good question. From from what I've studied and what I've watched, uh, Jim, I think that you may uh, move a little bit towards uh, Thomas Jefferson, but uh, it may you may be coming around to Madison. Madison, of course, was very very structured, and he was really the he was the we call him the father of the Constitution. Right. And that's because he was the one who devised the three branches of government, and he thought that that would be the best means by which to protect the natural rights of every human being, natural rights being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it was, it was the anti-federalists or those like Jefferson who wanted, well, you have to put the 10, you have to put the Bill of Rights in there. Just can't, we just can't rely on this 
um, this three branch system of government, this system of checks and balances, the separation of powers, as you will, which Madison, of course, um, was, was a great um, proponent of. Sure, but sure. let's start. To, let's start to talk, uh, Jim. I'd like for you to give us some definitions on um, some important terms. Now we heard we hear the word, and we've already talked about liberal. Liberal. We hear this. Well, you're you're a liberal, and I really think there's been a real um, inaccurate. Uh, it's been inaccurately as ascribed ascribed to people, because I would essentially say that you and I. And many of us are classical liberals. So what, what exactly does liberalism mean? Liberalism can be hard to define, and it's worth acknowledging mm -hmm. that. But it is a it is kind of two things at once in, in the big picture that have to be understood. It is a assumption that there are these underlying rights of people that should not be infringed. And you know, there are very th various theories like natural rights theory, where those rights come from and what, what makes them have meaning. But either way, that there are this idea that there are, are, are rights of each individual in particular. So it thinks in terms of individuals as, as the arbiters of their own destiny to, to the maximum degree possible, or at least of possessors of agency to make decisions and mm -hmm. live their lives as they will. Um, it has a preference to defer to objective standards as often as possible. Economically, for example, uh, capitalism is a liberal system. So the market, fair market price would be an objective standard that's outside of people. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a shared currency would be another thing that would be very frequently used because again, if we share a currency, it doesn't matter whether uh, what kind of a person gave you that currency, it still has its value. So this is a equalizing force. Um, it is going to uh, value uh, human rationalism. It's going to believe that even if we are irrational people in many of our actions and behaviors and decisions that we do have the capacity for being rational, that we can slow down and use our rational minds to make decisions for ourselves and become the, uh, the best judge or nearly the best judge of, of what's good for our, our own lives when we are mm -hmm. properly informed with, with, with the most reliable information that we can obtain. Um, and it, it seeks to secure all of that for people and create a system. And that's the second thought about liberalism that's so important is, is that it's a system of conflict resolution, of conflict management. Not mm -hmm. many people think of it this way. And I wish that I had the cleverness to have thought of it first, but that, that credit goes to Jonathan Rausch. Um, who wrote mm -hmm. a book in, in 1992 called Kindly Inquisitors, where he positions it this way. And the idea behind liberalism is that as a, as a set of, uh, as, a, as a protocol for conflict management is that it wants to take the person out of it as much as possible in every, in every turn. So if you and I have mm -hmm. a difference of opinion, maybe it's one where we bring the, the best evidence to bear or the most rational argument to bear. So it's no longer about our personal feelings or our personal stake. If we can't resolve it, maybe we find a third party mediator. If you get sufficiently far out, that mediator might be something like a judge. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have this, this process of conflict management that tries to minimize the influence of personal self-interest. Uh, as far as information is concerned, it, it, it demands the checking of each by each. So it, it demands a freedom of speech, demands a freedom of press. It demands freedom of assembly to come out and say the things that need to be said and let the arguments fly in each direction and let the best arguments survive and the worst arguments fall away. So, you know, there's of course been much written in the liberal tradition. Um, I probably find that, that John Stuart Mill's on liberty, I, I, I just to tell you, I one time I got my first print copy of it at one point, and I decided I was going to read through it, and I would underline everything I thought was relevant, and I realized I was underlining the whole book, which made it utterly pointless to underline anything. <laughs> right. Well, of course, he talked about utility, and uh, it's amazing that you know the very word liberal is derived from the word liberty. And uh, mm -hmm. that was, uh, you know, and this is a product of enlightenment thinking. And of course, John Locke was uh, indispensable in his writings and uh, talking about that. Now, I'd like to move in now to the book a little bit and give us a definition. Now, I know that the term postmodernism is difficult, but I think you did an extraordinary, you and Helen did a great um, a description of it in two, in two principles, which you call the postmodern knowledge principle 
and then the postmodern political principle. And um, to talk a little bit about that, but also the four major themes, which would be the blurring of boundaries, the power of language, and cultural relativism, and uh, relativism, cultural relativism, and then the loss of the individual and the universal. So talk about a little bit about all that. Right, yeah, so postmodernism is even harder to define than liberalism, and that has to be acknowledged. I don't think any of the postmodernists accepted that they were postmodern at all. They refused mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Judith Butler uh, famously said that she couldn't describe herself as postmodern because I would require her to define postmodernism, and if you defined postmodernism, it wouldn't be postmodern anymore, so that can't work. And so it's really difficult to define. It also is a series of different movements that evolved in different places at different times. It, it, there's there's postmodern art, there's postmodern architecture, those preceded the philosophy by 20 to 30 years. They, there's um, the French school of postmodernism differs from the American school of postmodernism, which is more pragmatist oriented. Um, the French school is in particular the one that we're focusing on because it's the one that's turned out to be the most influential. And so mm -hmm. the, the idea with mm -hmm. postmodernism, we tried to boil it down in terms of what consistent things show up in this kind of mess of uh, scholarship and thought and kind of rambling interest, you know, uh, rambling interests of a lot of very curious French thinkers who were undoubtedly also on a lot of drugs. Um, and we tried to, to simplify yeah. it down into a few themes and like you said, uh, principles that, that show up consistently right. ever since. And so we, we define mm -hmm. the postmodern knowledge principle is that objective knowledge or objective truth is not accessible to people. Everybody is fatally locked into their biases. Objective truth cannot be had. And it's an it's a mistake mm. to, to approach it. And in fact, they say further that knowledge is socially constructed. That's the postmodern knowledge mm -hmm. principle. So knowledge is something that societies create to tell themselves that they know about the world but, and, and they believe it, but it's kind of like a mythology within that, that particular culture or society. And so it's a social or culturally constructed entity. It doesn't have any correspondence to reality necessarily. Michel Foucault um, can be summarized as believing that to talk about whether a claim on the truth is actually true or false misses the point that it was actually installed by a political and therefore power-based process. Um, and mm. that's what's more relevant is the, the, the power process, the political process that, that led people to believe it is true. Um, the postmodern political principle is that there are, it, it's closer, it, you know, it's where they kind of drew off of the critical theory school without actually doing it. The critical theorists and the postmodernists were kind of at odds, but they drew off of this idea and they saw that there were certain knowledges that were privileged and certain knowledges that were were excluded or marginalized um, and th th that causes harm. So the postmodern political principle is that there is a political or a power-based valence to knowledge, ideas, um, all social interaction. And that is the thing that is interesting to talk about that needs to be interrogated as they would say, or called out. Um, you right. can see that probably most clearly in Jacques Derrida's idea of uh, phalagocentrism, which is where he believed that words appear that words don't have meaning in and of themselves. They only have meaning in relationship to other words. And mm -hmm. um, he believed that they appear in hierarchical binaries. So man and woman, for example, you can't understand what a man is in and of itself. You have to have woman to compare it to, but that there's a bias here that man is considered better than woman. And so there's a power mm -hmm. imbalance baked into the language. So you can see that this mm -hmm. is kind of the idea is that there are these hidden power dynamics everywhere and that they need to be pulled apart. And, and, and the word that Derrida gave to it was deconstruction. They need to be deconstructed, to be shown to be absurd. Um, so that leads into the four themes. Um, one of them, we can start with uh, the power of language, is this belief that mm -hmm. language and how we communicate our ideas, what they call discourses, the ways that it's considered to be acceptable to speak about things for Foucault, or the ways that um, meaning from one word to a next, you can think of it as, as the webs of meanings between words for Derrida, that these discourses mm -hmm. basically set a kind of very Marxian superstructure for society that constrain how that, that group of people thinks and sets the power dynamics and, and makes the power dynamics invisible because it's just the way that it is. 
And so it's trying to step outside of that, but simultaneously believing that language is, is too powerful and is dangerous. And that's why you see these ideas like that words are violence um, in, in kind of the stuff we see happening now. Uh, that, that if you use phrases like right. master bedroom, you'll remind somebody of slavery and you'll do them violence by doing so. Or within queer theory, you'll have the idea that saying, well, that person's a man categorizes them and if they didn't feel like that that day that that's a violence of categorization they call it right and gun violence too we hear gun violence all the time in new jersey jim it's well, not criminal violence it's gun violence right right yeah um the second theme that we could talk about is the uh, the blurring of boundaries that's uh, particularly poignant in a lot mm -hmm. of places but they, the the postmodernists described what they did very frequently as play which is a strange thing. They were playing with words. They were playing with ideas. They were mm -hmm. so, kind of, kind of, um, ironically self-aware and kind of cynical about even what they were doing themselves. And so they were trying to, you know, my friend describes it as they stand aside from the thing and take a crap on it. And it's the best way to possibly, it's like, they're too good for whatever it is they're criticizing. So they try to step outside of it and criticize it. Um, Mm -hmm. But one of the things that they really don't like is the idea of stable categories. So man and woman are stable categories, for example. Um, they don't like that because what if it mm -hmm. doesn't, as Foucault would put it, what if that constrains somebody's potentialities of being? What if that makes them feel right. uh, uncomfortable? So they want to blur the boundaries between certain things, man and woman, um, fact and fiction, storytelling, truth and false, uh, rigorous methodologies, um, pretty much everything. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the make those categorical boundaries as blurry as possible is a goal because they say that what's really interesting to play in is that ambiguity in between the categories and the blurrier you make them, the more, the more interest there is there. Um, a right. third is cultural relativism. Like we said in the, mm -hmm. the theme, the or principle, the first, the knowledge mm -hmm. principle, uh, they believe that knowledge is, is a product of culture. And they also believe mm -hmm. that each culture is kind of like an island or a, a kind of a feudal fiefdom. And mm -hmm. they have their own cultural products in particular knowledge, but also like manners of dress, manners of speaking, accent, dialect, and so on. All of the different things that characterize what a culture is as cultural anthropologists would put it. And the claim is that within each one of those, there's no standing upon which somebody could criticize another because each one is its own inherent system. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a great deal of relativism that you can't say Western values are superior to other values. And they would go so extreme with this to say that you can't say that Western values are superior to other values in terms of you know particular goal X, Y, or Z, like uh, securing the liberty of, of individual citizens. Um, so, so there's a great deal of belief that cultures are kind of islands unto themselves. And the last mm -hmm. of the, the four themes we, we draw out is a favoring of group identity rather than uh, the, the individual, as you'd have in liberalism, that's then backed up by an idea of universal humanity, that we're all, you know, made by our creator, imbued by our creator with, with certain inalienable rights. It's a universal statement about humanity. They would deny that those things are relevant. And they would say for the original postmodernists that your cultural group is what is relevant. That has changed since the original postmodernists were not very interested in identity categories like race. They did not link those necessarily to cultures. They saw cultures as more of a political thing, which makes more sense. They're actually more right than the people today. The people today have turned that into identity politics. And so black culture is a thing that black people have. And Indian culture is a thing that Indian people have. And white culture is a thing that white people have and refuse to recognize as such and so on. Um, right. But that is a product of applying the identity politics way of thinking to the postmodern denial that there is the individual or that there is a, a universal humanity that we all share. Exactly. And an example of blurring the boundaries, uh, Jim, and cultural relativism would be certain cultures that do things and think things that are just and legal, which we would repudiate as being illegal, unjust, and against the laws of nature and nature's God, if you want to, as we look back to the Declaration of Independence, which is what the fathers did in that respect, is, wouldn't that be an example of that? 
Yeah, of course. Um, so that, 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 that's definitely cultural relativism. And there's also the idea of, of blurring the boundaries of, of, of right and wrong until they don't really exist anymore right. or of human flourishing right. and suffering until those don't belong, uh, don't really have any meaning anymore. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now let's talk about social justice. Uh, you say in the book on the page 215, there is a problem that begins in our universities and it comes down to social justice. Now, explain to us the difference between critical social justice in social justice. Now, we hear the word in uh, New Jersey social justice um, uh, talked a lot about uh, with our current governor. We actually have an institute, the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice, and we hear this continuously talked about all the time in New Jersey. So please give us uh, the definition of social justice and then what is what you're saying is more appropriately described should be critical social justice. Right. So social justice is, generally speaking, in its broadest generality, the idea that society should be made more fair, more equal opportunity, less discrimination, less disenfranchisement, in fact, ideally none of either of those things, um, and that it should mm -hmm. present fair ways to distribute the resources and opportunities of society. Um, mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different theories about how one could approach social justice. A lot of people don't know that the concept of social justice first arose in a Catholic setting. A Jesuit priest, in fact, was the first person to talk about social justice. It yeah. didn't go very far from there, but um, mm -hmm. that that was actually in the 18th century. So that would have been, you know, mm -hmm. roughly at the same time the United States was coming into existence, or a little earlier. Um, yeah. It saw another resurgence religiously uh, in in the Baptists in the early 20th century with a man named Walter Rauschenbusch who traveled to Europe and he, to, to England actually, and he stayed with uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb and, and George Bernard Shaw was there. And he learned from them the ideas that became Fabian socialism. And he came back and then wrote down what he called the social gospel. And so you had a very mm -hmm. progressive movement coming out of Baptist theology uh, for many years. So those two things ended up creating roots of things that we see today, but those are just kind of presented to show you that there are religious approaches to social justice, which would be rooted in, mm -hmm. you know, trying to model off of Jesus's teachings and perhaps even Old Testament right. teachings about fairness and, and making a society that works more for every person. Um, mm -hmm. There are liberal approaches. John Rawls was a liberal philosopher. Um, you don't find today's so-called social justice scholars citing John Rawls except to criticize him because he came from a very liberal perspective. Maybe you agree with him and maybe you don't agree with him with his veil of ignorance uh, is maybe is his most famous um, thought experiment. Right. Uh, what was his, um, his, his book about justice? The title escapes me. Um, his very famous book. I feel a bit embarrassed to have lost it. Right. But um, no, they very progressive uh, too politically. <laughs> sure, of course. And so there, but there are liberal and there are even you know when we talk about the religious approaches it's very easy to understand that there are even conservative ideas about making social the, the, our social situation more fair more just outside of just where the law necessarily would reach um so that's kind of what social justice mm -hmm. would imply it's justice that kind of reaches outside of just what the law would would, would do and like I said, there are many schools of thought. We could say religious ones, we could say progressive ones, we could say liberal ones, we could say conservative ones. And then there's a critical theory one, which we would call critical right. social justice, which they have called critical social justice. We didn't come up with that name ourselves. That's straight from uh, Aslam Sensoy and Robin D'Angelo. Uh, Robin D'Angelo is mm -hmm. very famous. Aslam Sensoy is not very famous, but they wrote a book together in mm -hmm. 2012 and they describe critical social justice in great detail. The book's called, Is Everyone Really Equal? And so the critical social justice approach uses critical theory from the Frankfurt School, uh, very heavily, in fact, relying upon Herbert Marcuse's ideas of fairness mm -hmm. and unfairness and uh, the catastrophes and calamities of society, liberation versus oppression, to outline that to achieve social justice, we have to unmake the systems of power that have in the historically and therefore must currently still disenfranchise and discriminate against people. So racism becomes a system that holds down uh, racial minorities essentially forever 
and it's baked into the system, the, the laws, the, when I say the system, I mean everything that happens, the laws, mm -hmm. the, the ways we speak, the discourses from the postmodernists, um, mm -hmm. how we generate knowledge, what we consider to be the norms of society. This is where you saw that thing from the uh, National African American Museum from the um, Smithsonian, National Amer African American History Museum, I should say, at the Smithsonian where they had that, you know, mm -hmm. attributes of white culture and it was, you know, hard work and productivity and <laughs> valuing getting things right. And like all these things that are super racist if you take a step back. Um, and the Smithsonian <laughs> published recently and then they tried to say that they didn't mean to, but their values are still there and the values are still the same. They just took the actual uh, infographic they published down. But those kinds of things follow from the critical social justice school of thought, which believes that the dominant identity groups, straight white men in particular, but you can add lots more, uh, somehow hoard opportunities and resources and that hides itself from people's view. And so it's social justice is achieved by finding where the hidden racism is, finding where the hidden sexism is, the hidden misogyny, mm -hmm. the hidden transphobia, the hidden homophobia, the hidden fat phobia, the hidden ableism and disableism and calling those things out uh, and demanding change mostly demanding that whatever institution, law, policy, procedure, or whatever it happens to be, uh, it just goes away rather than having any constructive mm -hmm. um, recommendation for it to do. It's critical. It just takes, it criticizes and takes things apart. It doesn't have forward facing suggestions for how to build. Right. I believe uh, what you were looking for was John Rawls' book, A Theory of Justice. Is That's that what it. you were That's looking it. for? Yeah, Theory of Justice, of course. And, Thank you. And, and, he and of course, he, he talked about the fact that if you had a chance to determine where it is that you would be born, uh, isn't that part of the formula that you would That's right. obviously want to be born in a, in a justice society and uh, right. that's the, we should apply that thinking in, uh, with public policy, essentially. Right. Right. Yeah. That, right? That's his veil of ignorance is the idea that you should, we should want to design society such that if you had, right. no, you were about to be born into it, but you had no idea who you were going to be, you would be, you know, right. maximally happy, which means there should be no obvious discrimination where when you get born, you say, oh, shucks, I'm one of these people. The problem is, is, you know, that can easily get right. taken too far because nobody wants to be poor, but you can't just design outcome outcome equality because it doesn't work um you know communism of all forms fails and so uh it is easy and i understand that there's a great deal of criticism of roles for that aspect of things but if you think about it in just the kind of um identity-based dimension it makes total sense you shouldn't think that oh shucks i was born black and that's a mark against me or oh shucks i was born white and that's a mark against me or oh shucks right. i was born gay that's a mark against me um so you know right. I understand that the, the, there are issues there where there are actual material differences that come up for for good reasons, and then there are material differences that come mm -hmm. up for bad reasons. And my definition of social justice would be that we minimize the ones that come up for bad reasons. Yes, and that's uh, something that we completely agree on. And just to touch down, the idea of the critical uh, modifier in the social justice does indeed come from what we've understood good and called cultural Marxism coming from the Frankfurt School, which incidentally was invited to come over to the United States in the 30s once Nazism started to proliferate. And Columbia University was uh, were the hosts. And it's amazing that Columbia University, uh, Jim, as you well know, has always been a, uh, an academic institution that has put out a lot of people who've gone into media and, uh, mm -hmm. have, have for, and been, uh, been uh, gone into journalism. So that's why a lot of this critical um, thinking uh, really took off. But Marcuse's book, One Dimensional Man, uh, described, applied the proletariat application to the minorities and to women against uh, the bourgeoisie who would be considered white men, if you will. And this is where we get this oppressed versus uh, the, the oppressed, oppressing, the, or the oppressor rather, opp oppressing the oppressed. And the oppressed being this new proletariat, if you will, made up of these identity groups. And this is where we hear identity politics come from all the time, right? That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Students of Herbert Marcuse, in particular, Angela Davis, who um, did right. not study with him at Columbia, but rather at UC um, 
Davis, yes, I think. Berkeley, wasn't it? Berkeley or Davis. Yeah. One of them, California. Right. Uh, so Angela Davis actually went on to inform the black feminist movement and the black feminist movement, mm -hmm. which is that's it's not black people who happen to be feminist. It's a thing in and of itself. The black feminist movement is where critical race theory eventually largely developed. Half of it developed from critical legal studies with, with Derek Bell and the other half developed out of black feminism with his student, Kimberly Crenshaw, who, who fused those ideas together at Harvard Law. Right. Um, and yes, Marcusa, you know, we can talk about in One Dimensional Man, where he said that we have to take these these minority groups as he defined them, and we need to mix them together with the the intelligentsia in the university, the left intelligentsia in the university, to create a new kind of movement that that fights for liberation and justice. Mm -hmm. That was 1964. He wrote that. You can talk about his 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 piece in 1965, Repressive Tolerance which is where he outlines the idea that's right. totally bogus, but it's gonna sound very familiar now um, that we live, since fascism has entered the world at some point in the past, we always live on the teetering brink of fascism again. Fascism could arise at any moment. We're always in an emergency state of fascism. And so he took Karl Popper's idea of tolerance and particularly looking at the paradox mm -hmm. of tolerance that if you're too tolerant of that which is intolerant the intolerant will smash down the tolerant and so there's a paradox there and marcusa said well we need a discriminating tolerance or a repressive tolerance where we anything that could lead to fascism and again he said that's basically right. everything needs to be shouted down it needs to be stopped before it can can get off of the ground and that's really where this antifa movement got a lot of its ideas that's where the impetus to do cancel culture, to, to, to disinvite people or to um, deplatform people that we're seeing today, this is all rooted in, in repressive tolerance. And the idea that right. um, if people are allowed to speak unsavory ideas, then um, fascism or racism or sexism, which they, they see these things as all connected together, um, will take mm -hmm. root again. And they, that can't be allowed in any regard whatsoever. Right. Now, let's talk a little bit. We're, uh, we're, we're, it's amazing. We've uh, spent 50 minutes and it seems like it's been just a few, but it's been a fascinating conversation. But talk to us, Jim, about systemic racism. What is it and is it a reality? Um, so systemic racism is the object of study of critical race theory. So um, that is a critical approach. To and Derek, isn't Derek Bell... Isn't Derek Bell really the originator of, of critical race theory? He, Technically, he, he believed that the law he believed that the law was inherently racist against minorities. Correct. That's right. That's right. So Derek Bell at Harvard Law um, did believe that he believed, in fact, in ideas like interest convergence, where every bit of progress that's been made um, against racism, say you know, getting rid of segregation and Jim Crow uh, or abolishing slavery, was actually um, done in the interests of white people, not in the interests of black people and so, or other racial minorities. And so it was designed in a way that didn't get rid of racism. It in fact, just hid racism, it disguised it better, put a mask on racism. And so, you know, he says this quite explicitly. If you look at his book from 1992 called Faces at the Bottom of the Well, um, mm -hmm. he, he, he describes, I think the subtitle of the book is The Permanence of Racism. The idea is that racism doesn't go away. It can't be worked out of society it can, because it's intrinsic to how society operates. It only changes shapes, right. changes forms and hides better. And so critical race theory is the idea of finding that hidden racism as it keeps changing shape and changing form. Meanwhile, while calling for trying to unmake the system itself, which is the only way to truly get rid of racism. Right. Um, so you see, right. for example, in uh, the, the, the primary textbook for critical race theory is called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. Um, or maybe a primary textbook. It's by Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk. And in the, um, I think it's on page three, right in the very beginning of that book, they say that unlike um, traditional approaches to civil rights, which focus on step-by-step -step progress and incrementalism, uh, critical race theory calls into question the very idea of the liberal order, equality theory, uh, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. 
And so that's a quote or very, you know, almost word for word out of that textbook. And so critical race theory is designed to believe that racism is in everything, including neutral principles of constitutional law, enlightenment, rationalism, equality itself, and the liberal order. And so it's trying mm -hmm. to unmake those things. Systemic racism is how. That's the thing, that's the object of, that they have decided is the type of racism that's permanent and everywhere and always. So it's not necessarily the, the racism that individuals might express. It can exist with no individual racists. We could live in a society with no racist people, with no racist beliefs, with no racist actions, and the system itself could still be racist, uh, according to the systemic mm -hmm. racism idea. And same for every institution. There could be no racist laws, no racist institutions, no racist applications, but the system itself could still be somehow racist. And by having, they say that the way that you tell is if it has racially disparate outcomes. And so if there are any outcomes that affect races other than, than white in a negative way, that means there must be systemic racism present. So systemic racism, for, for people who understand the idea of the God of the gaps, which is an old idea that, that says it, everything we can't explain is God is the explanation for it. You know, how that's the old kind of Bill O'Reilly, right. tide comes in, tide goes out, can't explain that, must be God. <laughs> um, systemic racism is the equivalent of that for the operation of society to assume that racism is the is present in everything that happens. So my opinion is that systemic racism does not exist. And in fact, that it is a bankrupt concept. I do think that there are possibilities right. for institutional racism, for sure. There may be some. Uh, a lot of failed progressive policy mm -hmm. is institutional racism, as a matter of fact. Uh, individual racism, of course, mm -hmm. happens. And it we hope to minimize that as much as possible. We hope to hold people to account and try to have them not have racist intentions, mm -hmm. actions, beliefs, speech, or I mean, you can't control people's thought, but you can talk to people. Daryl Davis is famous for talking people out of their clan robes. Um, so it is possible to take a racist and make them not racist anymore. Uh, certainly, I think there's also what could be called, mm -hmm. although it's a fraught term, structural racism, which is not the same as systemic. I think of that as the, the kind of racism that might happen not within an institution, but between institutions. So if there's some kind of a, a bad design where mm -hmm. criminal justice and the legal system or the laws themselves, you know, all kind of, and even the penitentiary system, those systems in between them, there's some structure that makes them work together it's possible that racism could hide in there. And I think that we should we should actually look for those kinds of mm -hmm. intentions and we should try to minimize their impact. But the idea of a system of racism that's all pervasive, that's hiding just beneath the surface and that it's actually such that every instant of racism, whether it's an individual saying an epithet, whether it's uh, you know somebody being discriminated against in a job without anybody knowing, every instance of racism is actually part of a huge system that the whole society operates and that's its true nature. That's a bogus concept. That's a completely bogus concept. Mm -hmm. Right. I wish there was a right. two minute way to explain I it, agree. but there's not. And uh, a couple of points. One thing that amazes me. No, no, none of these uh, definitions are two minute definitions. But uh, one thing that amazes me, Jim, is the uh, how disingenuine the left are and uh, talking about white supremacy, uh, when we go back into history, we clearly see examples of white uh, supremacy in the 19th century leading up to the Civil War. And we see it in the slave power, and we hear it from uh, men like Jefferson Davis, and we hear it from Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president, upon which the uh, Confederacy was founded. And all of the secession uh, declarations by the succeeding states all emphasize the importance of slavery, and this is why it was done. And yet, that's the first thing. People talk about white supremacy. Well, all they have to do is look at the pictures of, uh, of, of these old Confederates and uh, Jefferson Davis, Alexander Stevens, George Fitzhugh, um, John Calhoun, uh, Roger Taney, who was on the Supreme Court. I mean, these men were real white supremacists. And then the other thing, Jim, that they don't give the Republican Party credit for is the fact that the party was initially founded primarily to stop the expansion of slavery and then to eliminate slavery, which is what our party did, led by Abraham Lincoln. But yet the 1619 Project doesn't mention it. 
those on the left don't mention all of the good things that we did to create civil and equal rights for black Americans. The 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, abolishing slavery, giving due process of law, and then giving the right to vote. But yet, this is never talked about. No, um, it certainly wouldn't be, because they associate the Republican Party with conservatism, with the status quo, and the status quo mm -hmm. to them is that system, maintaining that system of racism. So what they would say is that all of that mm -hmm. was done so that the Republican Party could hide the fact that it was really racist and wanted to entrench and maintain racist uh, policies and procedures, even though quite obviously the orientation toward race of the, the various parties at various times has, has changed here and there. Um, Lincoln's mm -hmm. orientation and uh, the, the point of the establishment of the Republican Party, I don't understand how that's, in, I do understand, but it's it's only in question by people who are not willing to do a honest read of history. Um, right. Things get a little more complicated around the Civil Rights Act era, of course. Um, and then you start having very complicated things since then, but they are absolutely, absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced that conservative politics equals racism because conservative means keep things roughly the same or don't move away too fast. And that the status quo itself, the system itself was created in racism by racists and it benefits racists the most and therefore it must be racist itself. Um, so no, you will not find an honest reading of history. As a matter of fact, the, a simpler way to put all of this is that critical theory is designed to give left-wing radicals double standards by which they're always right and everybody that disagrees with them has bad intentions or false consciousness or some other failing of character or epistemology or knowledge or something that makes them always wrong. Right. As we wind down, Jim, I want to uh, make sure that the people understand that, that the last chapter of your book uh, is entitled An Alternative to the Ideology of Social Justice. You not only identify the problem, which you've uh, done exhaustively, but you also give a solution to the problem. And that's what's so important whenever we identify problems. And um, you talk about certain things that need to be done and we both share this common denominator of the Constitution, which protects our natural rights that the Declaration of Independence talks about. And I really think that the Republican Party needs to get back to that ideal, to go back to the Declaration of Independence, uh, to reach out to the minority communities to, where we're doing that here in New Jersey. And we real, very believe it's very important to bring uh, Black Americans back to their, their party. I call them their, it's, I say it's their party. And, uh, but it's very important that people realize that uh, you have a plan of action, you're doing that. And I just wanted to, to show uh, through a share screen, um, I wanted to show this picture here, Jim, with us, because I think this is very appropriate for you. See this picture here? Uh, that's James Lindsay. <laughs> and, and uh, he has definitely done a great job in, uh, in getting the word out on critical social justice. And he is definitely in charge of the matrix. <laughs> I wanted to make sure everybody got to see that, Jim. And uh, very well deserved of what you're doing. And then the other thing I want to show people is this extraordinary website. Uh, new discourses. Now, Jim, every day you've got new information up here. Um, you've got a social justice encyclopedia, which we, we've been talking about with some of these uh, definitions. Uh, you'll see the uh, academic articles and the podcast. Jim, you're giving your grade two. Uh, I highly recommend our list. Hope you'll come back on. We'll have another discussion. Uh, there's a lot of information that for the work that you're doing. Um, if people want to see you on YouTube, just type in James Lindsay. You're going to see a lot of lectures. I wanted to say that um, you know, really, the objective of this conversation tonight um, was to uh, to inform the audience on the continuing academic and scholastic work done by Jim and your colleagues. Uh, Peter and Helen uh, on critical social justice theory, which really presents people 
an existential threat to uh, to our ideas of Western civilization liberalism, right? That's right. Yeah, uh, this is a credible threat against the West that's happening right now, and people really need to take it seriously. And it's not. Uh, and, and you've done interviews with the, the the British, with many people in Britain. You've done them with uh, interviews in South Africa. So this situation with critical. Um, critical theory, critical social theory is not just an American problem. It's a worldwide problem. And uh, it's something that needs to be talked about. Jim, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me tonight. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I think it went really well. It's been great. And uh, again, thank you everyone uh, for watching. Please share this video and talk about it and get it out there with people and make sure that you go out and get this book. It's very, very important. And, uh, we hope to see it on the New York Times bestseller very soon, Jim. Cynical so. Theories, Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. Keep up the great work, and uh, the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans are very happy to support you and everything you do, Jim. I'm so glad to hear that. Appreciate you all. We really are. We're all uh, education is the key, and that's uh, we, we both aspire to do uh, with our citizens because as Madison and the founders knew, um, a republic. In order to maintain a republic, the people needed to be educated, and they needed to know what was what was going on in their world. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Jim. And remember what Lincoln said as we end our end our conversation: liberty for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Appreciate it.